Um, so if any of you guys um, are a little bit hesitant about um, voicing questions, um, just know that we are being recorded, but you can also put things in the chat box and that would be absolutely fine. And we can vocalize those questions in the chat box. Um, so I am Ali Day and I am your inclusion coordinator for the College of Arts and Letters um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, and we are putting on this brown bag this year uh, to sort of think about how violence and unrest affects our work as um, folks that do work in the humanities and the social sciences. So we put out this call in the fall and we got a lot of really wonderful submissions and we put together a slate of six brown bags for the spring semester, each addressing this theme in really different ways, which has been fun. So the first one, we kicked it off with um, Dr. Asma Abdel-Halim, who talked about her work, um, which is ongoing and to the moment um, with women in Sudan fighting for democracy. Um, and then we had a second brown bag um, where, oh my gosh, I'm totally forgetting what our second brown, oh, Tasha <laughs> from communications, Dr. Tasha Dad talked about um, the role of social media and political and social unrest, right? And sort of um, what's been happening more recently in the past few months with things like Facebook and, and whether they should be held liable. And what do you do as a communications instructor when you're trying to sort of teach about these ideas in this moment in time? So today I'm really excited for brown bag number three, which was put together by um, at the um, I would say the impetus or the inspiration of Dr. Kim McBride, who is one of your newer faculty members in women's gender studies. And she really wanted to think about the intersection of violence in academia or violence in the classroom or how to help students address systems of violence. Um, and there's no better place than the women's and gender studies or the feminist classroom, where I think that happens in my own experience and yours. So she helped corral um, her colleagues, Dr. Sharon Barnes, the current chair of the women's and gender studies department and long-term U Toledo equity and feminist activist on campus. And Dr. Rachel Dudley, who is one of our newer additions to the women's and gender studies faculty. Did, have you been here? Is this year three for you, Rachel? Year three, year three. okay. The pandemic threw things off, um, but she joins us being someone who thinks very deeply about uh, Black women's health and the health humanities and sort of thinks about violence and teaching um, with that angle in mind. Um, and Dr. Kim McBride was just not feeling well today um, and is very regretful about not being able to make it to today's conversation and sends her regrets. And I know I'm sure we can all relate a little bit to feeling a bit worn down this time in the semester. So we wish Dr. McBride well, and I think we'll do just fine carrying on <laughs> with Dr. Barnes and Dr. Dudley. So I'm thrilled to welcome you guys here. And I know Dr. McBride was going to kick you all off um, with some thoughts and comments um, around um, violence in academia. And since she's not here, I was thinking um, if I might be able to offer, I guess, maybe an anecdote to help um, kick off the panel. I mean, I'm not actually officially on the panel, but I thought I might um, begin with an anecdote and then turn things over to you both, mm -hmm. um, if that's okay with you all. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah? Works. Okay. So I've been thinking a lot, as probably many of us on this call, um, about what's going on in the Ukraine and in Europe, right? And yesterday uh, morning, I spent, you know, the first three hours of my morning with the BBC coverage, like sort of in my ear as I was getting ready for school and walking to campus. And, you know, I had to teach at 11 o'clock. And so I got to, to my classroom and it's a disability in American lit class. And the particular book we're talking about right now doesn't really have anything to do with um, war or violence in particular. I mean, not directly, right? And I thought, oh, I, I should probably put all my thinking about the Ukraine aside and, and just focus on the plan at hand. But it's me and I really couldn't do that. So I just said, frankly, to my students who are so fantastic, I said, I don't know if any of you guys are distracted or have been listening to what's unfolding to the moment right now. Um, and maybe for some of you guys, it's in the back of your head and maybe for some of you, it's in the front of your head. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about the Ukraine and what's going on. Where are you guys at? And, and several of them said, you know, it's in the back of my head. I don't feel like I have the spoons to sort of 
even think about that right now. And then a few of my students were like, no, I'm, it's in the front of my head. One of my students said her great grandfather emigrated from the Ukraine. So she didn't have any family there, but she keeps thinking about right her, her heritage and what would have happened. Um, another student of mine who is um, a very proud Jewish woman was like, you know, we do all this work with Holocaust survivors in the Ukraine and there are so many and I'm thinking a lot about them. And so I said, you know, I'm not an expert. I don't, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I do think this feels like a moment as significant to me as 9-11-2001, which happened when I was 18 and a freshman in college. And I did not feel like I had a lot of tools to understand that moment. And um, I was really grateful to some of the professors around me who helped me sort of think about that. So I said, I'm just, I just want to offer a few things to help us um, in this moment of violence and unrest. So I said, you know, I want us to think about how what's going on in the Ukraine and war and conflict in general is a disability justice issue, right? And in, in sort of other frameworks, like a feminist justice issue. And I said, you know, first and foremost, we know that war and violence um, creates disability, right? Whether it's physical disability or psychiatric disability for both soldiers and civilians. Right, and it also creates disability through migration, um, and you know, sort of um, the the kind of migration and refugee st status that's that's happening, you know, to the moment right now. So that's one thing I'm thinking about. I'm also thinking about how when we decimate um, a city, we decimate a health infrastructure, and what that does is it creates um, opportunities for things like viruses to. Um, continue to spread and evolve and become much more difficult to contain and much more deadly. Um, and we see this, um, we thought we had polio pretty well contained um, by the 60s and the 70s, and we've seen it reemerge as a public health issue in places like Afghanistan, right, as a result of war. So I'm thinking about that. And that's with viruses we know really well, let alone a virus like COVID-19, which we don't know. And I say, I'm not saying this to scare you guys. I'm just saying it's like, it's something I'm thinking about. And then I said, the third thing is we know here at home that our supply chain is going to be real wonky and things are going to get real expensive really fast, particularly some of our, our most necessary goods, gas, um, food, um, things like that. And we know when things get expensive, the people that are hurt the most are our poor and disabled populations, right, of which there's a lot of overlap. And so it's a disability justice issue in that way. So, so then I said, <laughs> now that I've given you all these down you know, these downers for you guys to just feel really great about. I said, let's brainstorm ways that we can um, feel like we can engage. And so we talked about things that groups that we're involved with could do locally to like raise um, food drives and clothing drives and things like that as necessary in our local communities. And then how to find um, international groups where we could even, even giving $2 can be a lot because international groups like the American Red Cross have ways to take a little bit of money and do a lot with it through, um, you know, their infrastructures and buying in bulk and things like that. So we spent some time talking about what we can do. Um, and I think I asked the class of, and then, and then we transitioned slowly, but surely into the content for the day. And at the end of class, I said, how are you guys feeling? And they said that the conversation was actually helpful because it was something that was in their head. They couldn't get away from it, but it's sort of just sitting there, like on their shoulder, like, but what now, like, what do I do? I'm, 19 years old in Toledo, Ohio. This doesn't feel like something I have any sort of way to engage with. So um, I've been thinking about that a lot and that's what I did yesterday and I hope it was helpful for my students. Um, but it's one way I think um, I'm thinking about this intersection of violence in our academic classrooms. Like, what do we what do we do with that? So I'm a little bit, I'm not in the dark with what you guys are gonna talk about, but I don't know the exact angle you guys are gonna take. So I'm excited to sort of turn things over to you. Um, and hear about how you all have been thinking about this um, particular topic and where you might take us today. So I'll turn things over to Dr. Burns and Dr. Dudley. Thank you so much for that, Allie. Yeah, and for the invitation to be here and for all your work in organizing these, these panels. Um, for me, I did have that on my list of things I wanted to touch on, uh, which is about the importance, which I, I'm so glad you, you highlighted, the importance of holding space for processing, particularly, um, you know, big news events um, like this. And I've found it personally to be 
um, really important for students to hold that space, similarly to your experience um, in, in doing that uh, with your class. Through the multiple crises, um, they, I think, need space to process, and they talk about um, the importance of having spaces like in disability studies, like in women's and gender studies, um, where they can do that, that critical work or that processing work, that personal reflection work, or not, you know, if it's not, if they don't have the spoon. So I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because sometimes we just, we don't have the capacity for processing, but holding the space is, is a good thing, I think. Um, and we've had to make similar, you know, uh, um, judgments about how to bring these issues into the classroom <laughs> through the Trump years, teaching through, uh, through, you know, the, the first waves of COVID, teaching through and seeing the impact of that on our students. Um, through so much um, sort of civil uh, unrest in the world and through war, most recently as you mentioned with um, the, the latest provocations in, in Russia and the Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine. So um, I, you know, I was hoping that, I don't think we, we had a couple points we wanted to make sure to touch on, but I was also hoping that we could just have a community dialogue about whatever um, comes up that we've noticed in our classrooms. but. Um, so I'll leave it there for now other, and, and sort of see if, if uh, Dr. Barnes wants to jump in. But for me, I think it matters, in my experience anyway, it, it matters less how we do it, even though I think um, how Dr. Day structured that was really a, a beautiful way to bring it in and a powerful way to bring it in. But I, I think it matters less how um, than it does that we somehow, you know, hold the space um, when we feel that we can as instructors. But that's another thing that will come up, I think, in the conversation is how to deal with that um, perhaps secondary trauma of um, being in fields that engage um, so frequently with uh, structural violence and, and ha having to work through those conversations. Anything on that, Dr. Barnes? Sure, of course. On the um, Ukraine topic, I, I love what you did. Um, and I think that uh, it just so happened that my students had watched uh, for Tuesday a film on mail order brides called Love Me. And the sex tours that happened in response or, or as part of the film were in Ukraine. And, and so uh, when we came back to class, it was a part of our discourse. Um, are, am I cutting out? I'm seeing a little freezing. Um, you are, can Dr. Somebody Burns, and I love give me a Dr. Burns, you are cutting out a little bit, and I love seeing your face, but I wonder if you turn off your camera, if that will help mm -hmm. us hear you better. And maybe if you have any other tabs open, sometimes that works for me too, to close yeah. over the tabs. Give Dr. Burns a minute to reconnect because I see the little exclamation point in the corner of her box. Okay. Um, I love how you structured that though, Ellie, um, with, with your class and in terms of reflecting on Ukraine. The other thing I thought that was useful that we all could do perhaps is think through how, what are the, just taking a little bit of time thinking through what are the touch points for our particular discipline, like emphasizing that. Like, I like how you, you talked about, you know, the impact on um, disability and health infrastructure in framing yours. So I think that's something that we, we all could do is sort of tie it into at least, if not specifically what we're working on that week, at least generally to sort of uh, course themes and the themes of our disciplines. Yeah, definitely. Dr. Barnes, are you back with us? I think so. I froze up a little bit earlier and then it cleared up. So um, okay. maybe just, just uh oh, you're frozen again. Throw it up, please. So I'm sorry. I uh, I might try to join <laughs> join on my phone. I think it's better with your video off. Yeah, with your video off, we can hear you much better. Okay. Well, I'll. I was gonna say, if I go out again, I'll. I'll uh, join on my phone. Um, okay. Am I? Am I still good? Uh, You're still good now. I'm. 
Yeah, I so really want to hear about the mail order bride um, video and the connection to the Ukraine yesterday. Right. Yeah, we 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 started the class with that, you know, with asking if people were aware, kind of similar to what you did, but then um, just sort of talked about it as a, a historical um, consequence of uh, the a fallout from the split of the Soviet Union that there are there are ethnic um, you know, there are people who consider themselves Russian who live in Ukraine and part of the split up of the Soviet Union involved uh, um, drawing maps in ways that people don't always feel empowered about. And that one of the consequences, the economic consequences of that political um, reality for women was loss of economic viability which led to the rise of trafficking, prostitution, et cetera. And that, you know, these years later that we are seeing sex tours in the Ukraine are a consequence of uh, an economic consequence of that. And uh, so we kind of, I didn't make space in that moment for more processing about the um, invasion, but uh, I kind of just, really sad actually that I didn't, but I kind of just used it as a segue uh, to talk about the, the course. But I, I, what I really love about what you said, Allie, is acknowledging the uh, people's varied awareness and varied emotional like stress response to the, to the news. Um, and that's really where I wanted to start because I feel like the, this extraordinary moment where we're simultaneously living through a pandemic and watching what seems like a truly mad invasion of another country and simultaneously realizing that it's taking us away from um, a, a climate catastrophe that we're also in the middle of and that students are aware, we are all aware that this is all simultaneously happening to us. And yet we're trying to drink our coffee and do our homework and show up for class and uh, act as if the world is going to be whatever normal might mean in, in that context. And so it's not an easy time. And I think that um, for all the criticism of our students that I keep hearing about how you know, that whole snowflake critique and all of that. I, I like, I just, I ha started the semester by saying, you are engaging in an educational enterprise in the middle of a pandemic. Anybody who thinks you're not tough is not paying attention to what's really happening right here. And um, so I keep reinforcing that you know, college can be hard enough, you know, just, just the academic part can be hard, but lots of our students are also working. They're also doing all kinds of things and that that's challenging. And to do that with these other very serious things uh, is something I don't think we can, uh, we can't under affirm that in terms of the students' lives. And so I, 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 I often bring that back to their minds. Um, uh, and then also, I think what, what you both have already said about um, making space or Rachel, I think you said sharing space, but uh, that we are in spaces and we are trying to create spaces in our classrooms where, you know, we value diversity, we value difference of opinion, you know, we, we look at that, you know, house bill 327 or whatever it is. And we, we say, no, we, this is exactly what we want to talk about in a civil, respectful, empowered way. We want to talk about divisive topics and share our thinking and um, model for our students that it is, it is okay to disagree with each other and to actually maybe learn something from someone that you disagree with. And so uh, I think, Allie, your point about uh, you, you about the, the invasion, you were modeling uh, a, a response, a thoughtful response, a, a response that didn't have to know all the answers, but could engage with people and say, it's okay if it's not high on your mind, uh, but, but just, to have some human humane response to that. And I think that that's what we try to do. 
you know, we try to create those spaces in our classroom. So for me, teaching through is about being attentive to the process of um, engaging students where they are with what's really going on with them. Uh, and as Rachel, I think, or Dr. Dudley, as you indicated, um, you know, they could be experiencing some serious uh, trauma, um, that has nothing to do with the class or in our cases, I mean, I've had students, uh, you know, I had a student this semester who was experiencing some flashbacks in class because we were talking about violence and it was repressed memories. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we, this happens to our students. And so being, seeing their humanity and offering our support uh, sometimes extends beyond, you know, their academic or professional goals. And I think that's part, that's one of the most rich and rewarding parts of teaching for me. And so for, so teaching through this moment, it, it kind of emphasizes that role. And I can talk more about specific examples uh, if we have time, because, you know, I was teaching during 9-11. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I, I was a, already a, a, an adult, a, a working adult when that happened. And not that you weren't a working adult too, but that uh, I think that I can talk about that. And then I think Dr. McBride wanted to bring, so I'm just going to mention it because maybe somebody else can take this up, uh, talking about our own trauma and um, how the institution can be tra traumatizing to us and how we engage in good self-care around um, trauma that we may be experiencing or the secondary trauma that we may experience. So uh, sorry for a monologue, but while you can hear me, I felt like I needed to get all my issues on the table. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all your issues, Dr. Brown? Oh, uh, I probably have other issues, but we'll leave it at that for now. Your, your voice is coming in very clear right now, So, um, which is lovely. So. Um, do we want to open things up to the floor and see if folks um, want to sort of provide their own insights, maybe about uh, their teaching this week and how they might or may not have addressed um, the crisis in Ukraine or about um, other moments where they have addressed, let's say, um, uh, international conflict in their classroom in a way that one of the things that's hard for me is I always want to be careful that I don't look like I'm coming out um, as politically biased in terms of Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, because I know that immediately things have to run off, right? So I, I try to, um, but that can be so tricky <laughs> in moments where, you know, we clearly have ideas. But does anybody want to offer their own insights from this week or another instance? As folks gather their thoughts there, I just wanted to um, echo, to thank Dr. Barnes for that too, and to echo, I thought that was a great exercise of um, thinking through having your students get involved locally and internationally. So that sort of is empowering of, yeah, we can all feel overwhelmed, you know, and just bogged down by all of this, but if there's just a kernel of something we can do, then that helps, you know, that kernel of change. Um, to get involved, I think, is an important step of, okay, here's, here's how I can, you know, do something. So um, I, I love that you took time, you know, for that or to have them even think through ideas, you know, in class. The thing I try to do, no matter what, you know, and, even, and I'm thinking through, think, thinking through, um, what was it, uh, summer 2020 <laughs> and, um, you know, all of the racialized uh, structural violence that was going on and protests and COVID and all of that, and experiencing that as a black woman or the many, many as a black woman professor, which we are only 5% <laughs> um, rep in terms of representation in higher ed. So I'm teaching through that as I'm also, of course, processing all of this uh, personally, and then thinking through the impact. Of, we can see it shake out in our classrooms, the impact of structural inequality and structural violence. And, the D and Dean Gilbert has talked about this, how we've seen um, impacts on our, our Black and Latinx women students, because during COVID, of all, you know, we know, um, you know, about the, the gendered and racialized impact there in terms of who is most likely to be, um, you know, primary care takers or care, you know, care for next of kin or these kinds of things. Um, and so, um, 
and, and not able to then, you know, keep up with with their um, work in, in school. So we see all that, you know, shake out too um, in, in our classrooms. But I guess my point is before I, I shut up here and open it up for others, of course, is that um, I love the idea of doing all of this work regardless. And this is just me personally and trying to do it in an inspiring way, in an empowering way and in an affirming way. Um, and to me, that's radical to do that. And I'm thinking here of Bell Hooks. That's a radical act. It's a radical act in, in terms of feminist pedagogy um, to do that in a, in a culture of domination, in a culture of the violence that's going on in, in higher ed, which we could talk more specifically if we want, the budgetary crises, this and that, is to continue to um, have an energy of empowerment as modeling for our students. That's really, really important to me. Yes, yeah. Sharon. I wonder if I can, I'm going to turn off my camera to talk. I wonder if I can ask um, how you're um, simultaneously making space for students and each other to articulate our vulnerability and the effect of the stress on us, and yet also emphasize resilience, grit, stick to it, don't stop doing your work, don't stop moving forward on your path. Because I feel like um, accompanying this, this maybe it's generational uh, uh, mental health awareness in particular, like my students seem way more uh, self-aware about their own mental health and their need to take care of themselves. I am also, I, you know, I always say, you know, patriarchy is not going to reward you for trying to end it. So you, you, you have to accept that you are not going to get affirmation for this work in that way. You have to develop other kinds of um, reward structures or uh, structures that make you feel good. So how, how is, how do you work that balance with your students? I'm curious about opening that, that up. To others, um, for me personally, though, uh, I ask it just like that. I think, say, how can we affirm ourselves in? I would say something like in dominator culture. You know, and we're talking about beauty ideals, and we've gone through all of the, the ways in which women are objectified and so on, and advertising and, and et cetera. How this is racialized, et cetera. Um, I would ask them to reflect on um, what we can do, what we have in our power. Like we're not reinventing the wheel here, you know, is what I try to remember. So there are successful strategies. So I try to ask them, um, find something that is a successful strategy that a nonprofit or um, activist organization is doing right now in relation to this issue. And then I also say, you know, what are you gonna do to affirm yourselves or to practice radical self-love? Thinking here of the tradition of Audre Lorde, radical self-care. Um, what are you going to do? You know, what specific uh, tactics or strategies are you going to use? And they come up with the most brilliant, amazing things. For example, I'm going to um, limit my time on social media because we know it's, it can be so toxic. But then they also said something brilliant um, about being selective about the social media that we take in so that you're getting your news sources from affirming um, positive social justice oriented places. Um, and so they come up with the most amazing ideas. And I think that to me is what is inspiring is that we're like Ali did, um, we're working in combination with our, our, our beautiful, you know, big brain combined <laughs> um, to think through process I would feel and address it all, you know, um, and then to say, okay, here's a couple things that I can do, or here's how I'm processing this to care for myself and my communities. And then of course, you know, we must bring in um, the mental health resources. The other problem I hope comes up, though, is that when we do that, we often hear back that those um, offices, and this is not just here, but across the country, are over uh, understaffed and, and potentially overwhelmed. Um, and so, you know, and that their weight, their backlogs for students to get psychiatric attention. So we've got to be aware of that too. Um, but, uh, yeah, that that's kind of where I'll I'll stop there in terms of how I'm I'm thinking through these questions. 
would love to hear from others on the call though. And I'm going to just say one more quick thing about um, when we recommend institutional support systems when the support is not helpful um how that how damaging that is for the students and then how difficult it is for us to continue to um recommend rely on utilize and i think you know we as an institution and all institutions so i'm definitely not picking on ut here because this is a you know, people report sexual harassment and they get penalized. You know, this is not how that's, a, and I, again, not saying that's a UT specific problem, but to say that that's a, uh, that's where we have to try to figure out how to use our institutional power to um, create a structure where the helpers are also part of that feedback loop where they're getting evaluated so that they're constantly doing a better job uh, of being accountable to the services that we're actually offering. And I really will stop talking now. Would anyone um, like to unmute and um, share some thoughts so far in the conversation? We're talking about, I feel like I'm on like NPR. If you're just now joining us, uh, okay. today's show, we're talking with Dr. Dudley and Dr. Barnes about the how we address violence in our academic classrooms, um, whether that's personal or structural violence. Um, and we've talked about our responses in the Ukraine and um, this week. And I would say, you know, one of the places I think being 18 and in my first week of college in 9-11, 2001, um, I had wonderful models of professors who helped us engage in like that day, right? As things were unfolding, going to class and having, you know, one of the first classes I went to that day was led by a former ambassador to the um, Soviet Union, he was retired and living in Maine, and so he was, ad, you know, just teaching a class on international introduction to international relations. And he came in, and I wish I could remember his name. And he came in, and he just like said, "I don't have a plan for today. Let's talk." Right? And I had never sort of seen vulnerability like that in a professor. I mean, I had never, I had barely seen any professors before. It was my first week of college, but you know, like that um, has been a model for me you know, for 20 years in terms of thinking about that. So um, that was sort of a gift that was given to me as a, as a young student. Who's out there? Don't be shy. I'm not gonna be shy. All right, Dwight. Thank you. I, I love the conversation we're having. Thank, thank you, uh, everyone. Um, and I like the fact that we're talking about what's going on in the classroom. If I may also interject, this is for my own personal interest. Any advice for chairs? Because there's an upper level, right, of, of administration above what's going on in the classroom. There's the chair who's supposed to be keeping everything even keel and make sure that everybody's doing okay. Not just the students, but also the faculty. So any advice on our role and, and how we can improve the well-being of our faculty, but also make this a safe and open place for our students at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question, Dwight. Um, and I would throw that out to faculty members um, on the call, right? Like, what would you need from a chair um, in these moments? Um, do you need to see a chair like super even keeled or is it helpful to see a chair who is like, you know, I'm as upset as everyone else, right? Or I'm as uh, disorganized as um, you might imagine when you're trying to juggle multiple um, systems of violence and keep your shit together. Vulnerability, I think at least in for, for me it works, you know, to see that communication vulnerability and um, Sharon is really good in, in our department at uh, um, a leadership style that makes sure everybody is, is at least heard. That I, I will make, an, I may have to make an executive decision because this is my role. I wanna make sure that everybody is heard and affirmed, which I think goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also not ignoring things too. Like we can we can have the dialogues, you know, and uh, we benefit from a smaller, you know, department, you know, but we can have those dialogues. 
I see Hunter unmuted and I see Carrie Peralta too. Hi, so um, I am not faculty or a chair, but I'm a staff member at the university and I think it can kind of, um, the, the suggestion can maybe like kind of cross over um, for faculty, but I think for me, um, just having um, a, a staff or a supervisor, um, so maybe the chair, like checking in during when when there are these kind of um, hard times that like that are affecting people, just like a check in, being like, hey, like how are things, and like opening up that conversation because I know sometimes it's hard for people to reach out. Yeah, I think that's helpful, Hunter, too. And I know I always work from the assumption that I don't know anybody's background. So I'm going to assume, for instance, this week that like I have colleagues with family in the Ukraine and that they're dealing with that, right? I don't know that I do, but like I'm going to operate under the assumption that this is personally affecting people um, in very intimate ways because that makes me the most careful in terms of my expectations of, of peers. Carrie, did you want to say something? Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for this just really great conversation, much needed. Um, and I, I want to respond not just to Dr. Haas's point or question, um, but kind of piggyback, piggybacking off of some of the things that's that's already been said. Um, I, you know, one of the things that's really bothered me since the pandemic is, you know, we have a lot of university leaders that emphasize the need to be flexible, the need to be empathetic. And I just, you know, it's it's too bad that that's, it was a pandemic that took leaders to recognize the importance of, of being empathetic and, and flexible. And so I just think, you know, how there's also this kind of rush to going back to the normal. I think we need to be really careful with thinking about, about how we can continue to be flexible, be empathetic, chairs as well as just a suggestion. And I think we also have to carefully think about, about violence and not so much focus on it as a moment, but rather something that's ongoing and constant. And when we think about the issue of, of food insecurity with our students, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of structural violence that are, it's ongoing. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to put that, that point out there too, that we, we want to be conscious of it, that students are, you know, we're in a, we live in a system that is exploiting us constantly. It's violent constantly, um, you know, disproportionately to some groups than more than others. But I think we need to be, be, be conscious of that, that it's not just a moment, but it's, it's something ongoing and yeah, I'll stop there. I want to um, just read a comment from Dr. Barnes in the in the chat that the administration can also challenge itself to be flexible with faculty and staff exclamation point. Um, and I couldn't agree more. I think sometimes, especially early in the pandemic, we are being told to be flexible and empathetic with our students, but we weren't. We were given double the workloads, and you know, it didn't feel like we were given the same the same thing from our from our own um, administration. The thing to Carrie that I just want to tag onto because this idea of violence is ongoing. I have a colleague in disability studies um, at another institution, Angela Carter, and she's written about the problem of this idea of post-traumatic stress disorder because it assumes a post. And for so many people, there's no post. Um, there's no post-trauma. There's that trauma is ongoing and daily, often mundane. Um, right. Especially for, you know, and she's talking about, you know, for disabled people, but for brown people and black people, for people that have gone through war. And so it's really hard to sort of talk about the post issue because of this ongoing violence. Her work is really um, interesting. If anybody, her name's Angela Carter. So I'll put her, um, I don't, um, I'm not sure if I can remember the title of her article, but um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. That was something that she wrote that really affected me for a long time. I think too the the it's an opportunity for the institution to look at standard operating procedures and create le procedures that are less violent. And so when we talk about like um, Hunter, I really appreciate you weighing in because I think like you know it's one thing if a department chair and a staff member can negotiate humane response to that punch clock thing 
you know, but it would be really nice if we didn't have to work around the institution to come up with humane responses, but that the institution uh, was also interested in um, how do we help people do their work? And, and, and again, I don't think the administration is busy thinking how we can make it harder and more violent. I mean, I don't think that's what they're, they're doing, but I, I, I think that what, what our disciplines are, the disciplines that involve social justice and, you know, these, these um, uncomfortable dialogues offer is the opportunity for people who are not at the top of really linear power structures to share with those people about the effect of their decisions on our working lives. And I think we have a responsibility to do that. And so I think that's something I try to talk about in class and to, to try to make space for, as you all have been saying so eloquently, you know, room for what's an empowered response here or how might we interface with the institution in a way to come up with a, with a more humane policy, you know, and that can be a pretty frustrating experience, which gets me back to, you know, you got to find your own reward. The institution is not going to reward you for challenging. Yeah, this idea between the extrinsic and intrinsic awards um, or rewards, um, I think is really important. I think we could we could take this conversation in a lot of directions. People have brought up some really interesting points so far. Um, does anyone want to just throw an idea in the chat box about a direction um, to go in our last sort of 15 minutes together? Joey, is that a hand? Thanks for using the hand button. Oh, of course. It. Sorry, I would turn my um, I would turn my video on, but I think I'm my hair is not pretty enough today to be recorded. So I'll just speak to <laughs> I'll just speak to you. All. Um, I, one thing that I've been thinking about. First of all, thank you all so much for this conversation. It's been really stimulating. Um, but I've I've sort of been turning over in my mind a little bit the phrase that you were using earlier, Ali, um, which I I think we we use frequently to talk about, especially things like Ukraine, where you. you use the phrase violence and unrest. And I was really taken by the word unrest today in a way that I haven't been before. I think in part because we were all before we sort of officially started just sort of chatting informally about how fatigued we are. And unrest struck me as potentially um, generatively different than fatigued. That unrest might be, whereas fatigue might be something like, you know, a lack of rest a feeling of being tired. Unrest might be an active state of taking away rest. There's something, there's something unrestful about the times in which we live. Um, and so in terms of teaching, one thing that I've been thinking about as I've been listening to you all about your practices in the classroom and my own sort of attempts to, to navigate, you know, as, as, as the topic of this panel is like structural violence in the classroom. Um, I, so I come from a discipline that you know, from literature where it, you know, I was trained in a, in a joint program in English and women's studies. So I am trained as many of you all are in thinking about structures of power and domination and violence. And that is sort of, I use literature to think about that. But of course, literature is also a form of solace for many people and a form of pleasure and a place where people find whatever the opposite of unrest is, right? And so I, I don't know how, I think in some ways, I, I often feel myself torn as a teacher between offering students my own sort of intellectual, what I can sort of help them see intellectually is to see structural violence. And in some ways I feel like I'm pulling them away from the rest and the beauty and the solace and the aesthetic appreciation that they might garner from the text by offering them the tools and the lenses to be able to think about all the forms of unrest that are in them too, right? So maybe some of my students want to read Shakespeare because Shakespeare is really beautiful and they just want to experience that. And here I am talking about, you know, sexism and racism and homophobia, right? And that feels like a pretty fundamental tension to me as a, as a teacher. And I wonder how other people deal with that? Are there ways that we can, obviously they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but you know, are there ways that we can 
try to cultivate active practices of of rest and hope. And I mean, I think, you know, Rachel, your term was empowerment earlier um, for our students within the context of also teaching them about these structural issues. Laughter. <laughs> it's one that works. At least that I, I try. Did you to. say laughter, Rachel? Laughter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, joy and laughter. There's a certain irreverence about it, you know. <laughs> like we will be joyful, damn it. <laughs> Here's some tools, y'all. No, um, humor and laughter. I think even the subversive, um, you know, aspects of humor and laughter is, is at least personally, is one tool that I try to use. Um, that one's hard because um, you, you know, there's uh, you have to toe the line. You, you want to make sure you're you're giving the reverence or, um, to the challenging topics and, and really um, not minimizing the severity, um, but also sort of thinking about the subversive and you know, radical potential of humor. Um, Margaret Cho, Richard Pryor, you know, these type of folks, their, their approach was it, this, this truth speaking that you can do through humor, really, and through comedy. So that that's one way for me, but um, I love that question, Joey. That, that's that's all I got. I'm curious about others. I also really like that question. And um, I, I when I taught my Disability American Lit class last spring, right? So it, we're, we're in the midst of the pandemic. People are starting to get vaccinated, but everyone's really tired of the pandemic. And I, I, I loaded it up with novels and poetry and short stories and had much fewer critical articles in that syllabus. Okay. And the reason I did that, and I said to the class, I said, this is your moment to just read, to just read and absorb and lose yourself in some of this literature because we've been so um, sort of overcome with all these other stresses. And that was a choice I made, right? And I brought in, of course, some of the critical theory in, in our conversations and our lectures, but I just, I said, when you're home, I want you to read this and lose yourself in this um, because I think we could all stand to get lost a little bit in some fiction. Um, and then yesterday I was just teaching and I thought I was teaching this book called Bitter in the Mouth. It's an awesome book and the main character is has synesthesia. And so she writes with um, the narrator uh, with synesthesia, um, puts the taste of the words that she hears in parentheses um, all throughout the book. So it's a really interesting way of reading. But it's and it's a serious topic and there are serious things in that book. There's sexual assault that we have to talk about. There's racial difference of being a Vietnamese um, adoptee um, in the 1980s. But the, uh, there's another thing in the book, which is so lovely, which is um, the narrator and her best friend have an obsession with Dolly Parton, right? And that obsession with Dolly Parton helps us balance in this really wonderful way, um, some of the seriousness of the issues in the book with also some really interesting and funny moments, right? Of these two young girls, because it's a coming of age story, these two young girls just loving Dolly Parton and people around them saying she's trashy, right? And then us being able to have a conversation about Dolly Parton and, and her image, right? And how she's evolved an image and what she does. And um, that's just one way. It's like, there are ways to balance that tension, right? That, that authors use in their books and that we also, I think, do so, for so many of us, like kind of naturally in our classrooms, I think, um, you know? I, I would add um, one of the things that we talk a lot about, and I'm and I'm sure you do too, Joey, is, you know, we, we talk about how things are structured in such binary ways um, so that we're always kind of interested in working that both and um, situation. Um, and so one of the things that we talk about in my classes is how can this be simultaneously beautiful and um, problematic? And that that we encourage a kind of comp complex or complexity in our response that we're trying to um, prompt you know, in ourselves and in our students. And so I think that's another strategy is to remind them that both of those reactions of, wow, this is politically deeply problematic and there's also something very artful about this. I think it's a, it, it speaks to the complexity of the world we're in. So I don't know if this is gonna like 
this came to mind while Joey was talking. Um, and so as an undergrad student at the university, um, there was, um, Allie, I'm pretty sure it was you. <laughs> um, um, so in one of our classes, like it was like right at, right after Trump was elected, um, like there's a lot of like, um, you know, upset, you know, students, th there were lots of emotions. And I believe like in one of the classes you like briefly were like, you know, like I'm here to support you guys. And like that really like was, I don't know, it, it meant a lot to me, but then also I know you sent an email or mm -hmm. so I'm pretty sure it was you, you sent an email, yeah. hey, like if you need to like process this, please come and talk to me. And like, I think as a student, it was so great to like know that that space was there. Mm. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I that sounds like something I would have done. Yeah, I, was, I think I think it was you. I was so pissed about the outcome of the election, and I just couldn't. It's not. I, my mom has always said my face betrays everything that I'm thinking. Um, to my to my damnation, probably, but um, I just couldn't, you know, cover it up. So um, it's just better for me to be honest, and <laughs> when I'm super pissed or whatever. Um, I also we only have five minutes left, and I'm gonna I. She's gonna hate me for doing this, but I'm so curious about um, Melissa, Dr. Baltus, what you think and what your experience is because you teach um, about um, indigenous peoples, and we and we all teach from land that has been forced where indigenous people were forcibly removed. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights from your own work, um, teaching from that perspective of how how you manage. Um, getting students engaged with that conversation and also um, sort of honoring the peoples who lands we are on. And if you have anything that you might wanna add, I know I'm putting you on the spot, so you're gonna hate me, but um, maybe you can forgive me. The punishment will come later. <laughs> I thank you. Um, no, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And honestly, I've been sitting here sort of in my thoughts of from the beginning, Allie, when you said, you know, your experience with 9-11 as a college student, and I was thinking back to my own experience and I, unfortunately did not have the same sort of faculty model it was continue status quo as things were happening in a history class um so i i guess i i try to reflect back on that and um you know in these in these times of struggle i i realize i have my own struggles in how to continue to give the students the education that i think they deserve and to challenge them in the way that i think they 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 deserve to be challenged to think about these difficult conversations. Um, and right now I'm, I'm teaching our, our history of anthropological theory, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. starts with the very extremely problematically colonial and violent beginnings of social sciences. Um, and you know, we, we haven't we haven't muddled our way out of it just yet, but trying to draw that conversations back in in terms of, okay, let's think about why this is an extremely difficult way of thinking about the world at that point in time and how we reflect on it differently now. Um, and it varies from my upper division classes like this to my, you know, intro to archaeology classes, uh, but trying to, without feeling like I'm on my soapbox, um, you know, discuss the history of these disciplines and the way that they are structured initially in violence and how they have moved beyond. Um, so I'm honestly excitedly waiting for the later part of the semester where we read indigenous theories um, mm -hmm. and bring that into the conversation. But yeah, I mean, I I can't honestly say I, I have much to offer in terms of advice. I'm honestly here to learn. <laughs> um, I. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we're all here to learn. I think we're all just kind of muddling through, but I think it's really interesting to think about those of us in fields that actually come through um, systems of violence. And so I know my partner teaches a class called Human Society Through Film with you guys, and she sort of teaches about the entangled history of the creation of anthropology in the, in the beginning of film and ethnographic film and how those two things are directly related to one another and what we do with that, right? Um, so I think that's really interesting. Um, we have two minutes um, left together, um, and I just wanted to make sure folks know we have three more of these brown bags coming up after spring break, and uh, Dr. Haas Dwight is going to be doing the next one, which is on March 17th, um, so bring your green dyed PBR to the virtual 
brown bag. Um, and Dr. Haas, do you want to tell us um, a little bit of the topic that you're going to be talking about since I have you here? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, real quick. Um, it's going to be it's going to be reflecting on research and work that I've done in other countries, focusing on El Salvador, Nicaragua, Chiapas in Mexico, Palestine, and dealing with situations where I'm coming into situations where there's a conflict going on or a conflict that had gone on, and my research is focused on poverty alleviation, and we're talking about how to alleviate poverty and trying to do quantitative research to assess the factors affecting poverty without talking about what just happened. Mm -hmm. um, the violence that went on that caused this all this poverty that you see going on. And so I'm trying to explore ways to make quantitative research something more akin to uh, you know, what Michael Burrowvoy would call an extended case method. How do we do extended case method quantitatively, you might say? So that's what I'm looking at. Awesome. Um, so I am really excited about that conversation. I think that's going to take us in some um, really interesting directions. And I am not somebody who is um, does quantitative things at all. So I'm really excited to sort of think about how to engage that kind of research with the kind of things that I do as a qualitative and sort of humanities-based researcher. Um, I want to thank um, everybody that's on the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for the college for um, help continuing to help put this series together. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for coming. And we will put this on the College of Arts and Letters YouTube channel. So um, check back there in a couple of days, and you can share this with classmates and colleagues, um, however much you would like. Thank you guys for coming and thanks Dr. Dudley and Dr. Barnes and Dr. McBride for putting this together today. Thank you all so much. Ditto, thanks, thanks everybody. Bye all.